Remember what we were doing last time, we stopped, uh, we were talking about limits and we sort of you know, gave this, this definition <laughs> with epsilons and deltas. And then we started um, talking about some properties of limits. Um, and one that I think we closed on was this one, which we call limits and arithmetic. Limits and arithmetic or limits and algebraic operations. And it sort of seemed kind of dull, right? It says um, uh, if the limit of one function is L as x approaches C, and the limit of another function is M as x approaches C, then a bunch of things happen that, that you, you think would be you know, normal to happen. Um, then one, um, the limit of the sum is the sum of the limits, right? The limit of the product is the product of the limits. The limit of the quotient, the quotient function is the quotient of the limits um, as long as, as long as m is not zero, right? And um, if alpha is some number, then the limit of alpha times f is going to be alpha times the limit. So this is sort of an, uh, a, a, a statement about the order, order in which you can do things, right? You can sum, sum the functions first and then take their limit, or you can take the limits and then sum them after, right? This is the limit plus <coughs> the limit, right? The limit of the sum, you can, you can sum these guys first and then take their limit, or you can take the limits first and then sum it after. It doesn't matter. You're going to get the same thing. Same thing for this, you, know, you can either take the product of these functions and then take the limit, or you can take the limit first and then multiply those things after, right? So these are, you know, you can divide, blah, blah, blah. You can, you can multiply by some number, multiply by a scalar, and then take the limit, or you take the limit first and then multiply by the number after, okay? So these are, these are what, what the, the way you say this is that taking the limit, um, taking, the limit uh, commutes commutes with whatever. Taking the limit commutes with addition. Taking the limit commutes with, with multiplication. That means you can do it in either order. Okay. That's that's the mathematical term. Okay. okay. So um, so like I said, maybe this seems like a pretty pretty dull dull thing. Um, we're not gonna we're not gonna prove it. Proving, if we wanted to prove this, then we'd have to go through more epsilons and deltas. Uh, I think we, that's okay. We'll, we'll just leave them away. No. Okay. Um, so you might think this is a pretty dull thing to say, but what's great about it is this. Um, uh, so um, suppose you have a polynomial on x, x to the fifth plus x to the fourth plus three x minus two, say. Okay. And you know, somebody tells you that the limit of this as x approaches you know, 1 is uh, uh, 3. Okay. The limit is 3. Okay. Now, if, if you had to do it using the epsilon, some, if somebody says, OK, now, now prove it to me use the def using the definition of limit, then you have to go through all the epsilons and deltas again. And it's going to be a lot harder. Okay. It would actually be pretty, pretty hard to do this using the epsilons and deltas. But instead of doing that, you can use this theorem. Okay. And the theorem will actually say, uh, will actually do this for us. And here's how. So the theorem uh, uh, will solve, you know, solves such problems. Okay. Um, and um, so here's why. Here's why. 
you start off with, I, I, this is what we ended with last time, but I, I want to sort of re reiterate it because it's, it's, it's important and shows you sort of the power of this theorem. Okay. So the first thing is you say, well, look, if I take the limit of x as x approaches 1, what's that? The limit of x as x approaches 1. It's going to be 1, right? You can, I mean, if you want, you can prove that using epsilons and deltas, but you know, certainly, you know, that's, that's, that'll be easy to do, okay? Um, right, or if I say um, the limit of x as x approaches c, that's, gonna just, that's just going to be c, right, for some constant. <coughs> so you make a bunch of observations. Here's the first observation. Second observation, the limit of um, x squared as x approaches c is going to be what? It's going to be c squared, okay? It's going to be c squared y. Why is it? Well, you think of this as one function times another function, right? It's x times x, right? So it's the limit of x times x as x approaches c. And then what do we say? What do we say? We use the theorem. What part of the theorem? Part two. Part two, right? Use part two. It says you know, the limit of a product is going to be the product of the limits, right? This is going to be. Um, the limit of x as x approaches c times the limit of x as x approaches c, which is c times c, right, c squared. Right. Um, okay. Uh, and in general, right, if I say, in general, the limit of x to the n as, as x approaches c, right, for n some natural number, right, what's that going to be? C to the n, right? Why? Why? You got c, you got x to some power, this is just going to be, you know, x times x times x n times, right, and then you use <coughs> the same thing. You use the same same thing, and then you get this is going to be the product of those limits. You get c to the n. Okay. Okay. Observation number four. Um, further, the limit of alpha x to the n as x approaches c. Uh, so alpha is any any fixed number. What's this going to be? So let me call it alpha sub n. I just call it alpha. What's this going to be? Just go ahead and say it if you know it. Kayla, you look like you're going to say it. Um, can it just be like alpha c to the n? Alpha times c to the n. You get the alpha c to the n. Right? Right? Because of property number four. Just working out that that number two was by two and number four was by four. I didn't plan that. <laughs> I wish I had. Yeah. Um, I had a professor in college who was such a genius of teaching that he would come into the room and there would be all these equations left from the previous class. Like this whole board would be covered with equations, and he'd come in like every day. He would do this. He'd come in and go, <laughs> kind of an old old man. <laughs> And then he started racing. And he, he would leave a graph here. He would leave some, some equation here. And, you know, like this. and then he would start lecturing from the left side of the board on whatever the topic was for the day. And when he got to the graph or whatever, he'd work that graph into the lecture. <laughs> and it would just flow right into the lecture that he was, that he was doing that day. And we always would be like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so great. <laughs> Yeah, but this is just chance, I'm afraid. That, that. Um, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. And then the last thing you want to see, and you see this is where I'm going to fail. <laughs> By property one, um, if you add these things together, right, if I have something like um, 
the limit of uh, alpha alpha 1 x plus alpha 2 x squared as x approaches c plus alpha n x to the n. But what's that going to be? What's that going to be? Well, If I have if I have some polynomial, <coughs> so the last thing you want to say is, is number five. Right? So um, if I have some polynomial, some polynomial um, alpha naught plus alpha one x plus alpha two x squared plus alpha n x to the n. Right? You have some polynomial p, and it looks like this. Then <coughs> the limit as x approaches c of this polynomial is going to be what? Just putting everything together, right? We know, what do you know about each of these pieces, right? What's the limit as x approaches c of this piece? Alpha 1 times c. Alpha 1 c, right? This is going to be alpha 1 c. What's the limit of this piece as x, x, x approaches c? Alpha, alpha 2 c squared. Each of these guys is going to go to alpha n, whatever. This is just going to be alpha naught, because it's, it's a number. It's a constant number, right? So it doesn't change, right? And so what you see is that the limit of a polynomial um, so by, by part 5, uh, by part one, I'm saying. <coughs> By part one, if I have some polynomial, the limit of the polynomial um, uh, is just polynomial P as X approaches C is just P of C, right? You just evaluate the polynomial at C, right? You take your polynomial and you you evaluate it at C. Okay. So going back here, here's a polynomial. What's the limit as x approaches one? You just evaluate it at one, and you don't have to use epsilons and deltas. You can say by the theorem, uh, the limit of a polynomial is just to get the limit of a polynomial, you just evaluate the polynomial at that point. Okay. So what this says is that um, remember we said that there are some functions that there are some functions that if you wanted the limit, you could just evaluate them at the at the point. And it's what this is saying is that polynomials um, are 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 those are some of those functions. Okay. Poly polynomials work like that. There's other guys that work like that, but at least polynomials do. So this is great. Uh, this is great because if we didn't have this theorem, then we'd have to um, we'd have to go through <coughs> epsilon and deltas every time we saw a polynomial. But now we don't. Okay. So that's that's the benefit of this theorem. Okay. Right. So right, the limit of a polynomial. Of your polynomial, as <coughs> approaches c, is just going to be p of c for p polynomial function. Okay. We also have that dividing um, that statement about quotients, right? So, in fact, we can use that together. In fact, um, if f of x is some polynomial over another polynomial, right? A quotient of polynomials. <coughs> then the limit of f of x as x approaches c is just going to be p1 of c over p2 of c, as long as p2 of c is not 0. And 
that's by property three. Does anyone know the name of, of this sort of function, a polynomial over a polynomial? There's a name for them. Anyone know the name? Rational functions. These guys are called rational functions. So, um, so what we're saying is that if um, R is a rational function, rational function, <coughs> then the limit of x approaches c as the limit of r of x as x approaches c is r of c as long as the denominator makes is not zero as long as the denominator is not zero So rational functions also fall into this class of functions where you just evaluate to get the limit. Okay. So this is great, right? You know, if I give you the limit of x squared plus you know, 3x plus 2 over you know, x plus 1 as x approaches negative 1, you can tell it to me. Oh, uh, wait, no, you can't tell it to me. <laughs> Negative two. You can tell it to me, right? Take, take 10 seconds, tell me what it is. Ten, 10 seconds to figure it out. What is it? What is it? It's zero. It's zero, right? It's zero because you just evaluate by, by the theorem, you just evaluate. So you say, okay, I get, um, I'm going to evaluate the top at negative 2. I get 4 minus 6 plus 2, that's 0. On the bottom, you get negative 1 plus 0. Okay. Right. And you don't need to use, you don't need to go through an epsilon delta kind of argument unless you want to. Right. You'd have to say, like, um, you know, you want delta so that if x this is less than delta, then this thing minus 0 is less than epsilon. Right? And you'd have to go through this argument, which would be kind of awful. Yeah, wait. So if the limit was x approaching negative 1, couldn't you just cancel out the bottom? Because if you factor out the top whole number, then it would be x plus 1 times x plus 2? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then you just find the limit that way. Yes. There would be a hole at negative one. Yeah. That's right. The function would have a hole, but the f it would still have a limit. Yeah, okay. it would still have a limit. Yeah. Okay. Any any questions on 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 you know, like how great this theorem is or on how to use it? Pretty, pretty simple, right? I, I think you can see that it's a useful thing and that the application of it is just, it allows you to plug things in. Okay. Any questions? Okay, next one, uh, the next useful theorem is something called the pinching theorem. The pinching or squeeze theorem. So um, uh, it goes like this. It says, well, uh, um, let C be some point in the reals. You know, it's going to be the point that you're approaching, just like you, know, you take the limit as x approaches C. Okay. So C is some number. Um, suppose <coughs> you have functions f, h, and g. Okay. Um, and you also have that f of x is always less than or equal to g of x, and g of x is always less than or equal to h of x. Okay. So there's some relation between these three, th these, these three functions. You know, f is always the, the least, has the least value, 
you know, they, are, they always fall into this order. Okay. So, you know, in the picture, right, you have one guy, another guy, and another guy, right? The high, the high middle, and the low, low function. Okay. Um, so here <laughs> is the statement. Um, uh, if the limit of the low guy as x approaches c equals the limit of the high guy, and say that the thing that they approach is called L, then, and when. Don't blurt it out, but think about it for, for a minute. Let's see if you can tell me what you think should happen. Right. If the limit of the low guy and the limit of the high guy are the same as you approach a point, then what's going to happen? Talk to somebody nearby for a minute. Now, who would like to say? Brenna? Would G of X also be the same? What do you mean G of X would, be the like, same? Okay, so since the low one is equal to the high one, would the middle one also be equal to the low and the high one? The middle one? The middle one? So I think what you mean is that the, 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 the limit, limit, uh, yeah, limit, the limit yeah. Yeah, of G of X would also equal the limit of F of X yeah. and the limit yeah. of yeah. Yes, exactly. So that's what's going to happen. Okay. The middle guy is also going to, the middle guy will also attain a limit, and the limit will be, will be L. Yeah. Just a second. Okay, so here's the picture. Here's the picture. You have one you have one function and you have another function and they both attain the same limit, right? So you've got a high, the high guy and you've got the low guy and at some point they have the same they have the same limit and then there's some function, some other function that's <coughs> trapped between and that function could be wild. Okay. But um, because because the high guy, because it's trapped between the low guy and the high guy, and the high and those two approach a limit, then that 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 <coughs> middle function, no matter how wild, is is going to have a limit. Okay. So that's that's if it's trapped that's between because it's trapped between them, right? You, from the beginning, you're given that uh, f lies between f and h. Okay. Right. Okay. So here's the example. Here's like the standard example, right? Um, if I look at um, uh, f of x being um, x times sine 1 over x. Does anyone know what this function looks like? Anyone say what this function looks like? Let me give you, uh, take a few minutes and try and think of what sine 1 over x looks like. So draw, take a minute and see if you can draw a picture of what sine 1 over x looks like and also x times sine 1 over x.
turn to somebody nearby and say, here are my pictures. Here's, here's you know, roughly what the sign looks like. Here's what the sine of here's what sine x sine of x looks like. Right? But we're talking about sine one over x, right? And as x goes to as x gets small, right? Suppose x is heading towards zero. Then this one over x, what happens to it? As x goes as x gets you know close to zero. Suppose x is a positive number and it's getting close to zero. What happens to 1 over x? It gets bigger, right? It gets really big. Right? Right? Heads off towards infinity, right? Here's the function 1 over x. Right? Heads off towards infinity. Right? So this 1 over x, as x approaches 0 from the right hand side, heads off to infinity, right? Which means that it's going to zoom off towards infinity, right? So what, is your, what does your graph look like? Well, it's going to become. Well, does anyone want to say? Anyone have a picture? Your graph is going to become uh, like start going like faster and faster and faster. It basically compresses everything that happens between here and infinity into this into this bit here. Okay. Similarly, right on the other side, you're going to have something like you know, something something pretty similar. And then slows down, slows down as we go up here. Okay. Um, okay, now suppose, so that's what sine 1 over x looks like. Suppose now you multiply it by x. Now what's it going to look like? Well, you're multiplying it by, you're multiplying it by x, right? So you're multiplying it, out here you're multiplying by some huge, by bigger and bigger numbers. Right? And over here, you're multiplying it by smaller and smaller numbers. Right? So what happens to the graph? Well, it's going to look something like this. Right? It's going to be something like this. And then come in. And that wildness is still there, but, but you're trapped between these two functions. Okay. But you're trapped between these two functions. So that's, this is what x sine 1 over x looks like. Okay. Okay. And so if you wanted to um, if you wanted to talk about if you wanted to talk about the limit of x sine x x sine 1 over x, excuse me, as x approaches 0, well, you see what we're going to use, right? We're going to use the pinching theorem. Right. What's what's what are we going to use as our as our dominating function? We need a function that's bigger than it. And we're going to use uh, the the range of one and negative one in between. No, because I I want x yeah, so x then sine you x. Can multiply both sides by x times and x. x. Okay. And x. Okay. So you're going to use um, x. But you also you want this thing up here, negative x over here, mm -hmm. right? So I'm going to take the uh, the absolute value function. Okay. Right. So you get it. Uh, negative x is less than x sine one over x is less than x. Yeah, negative absolute value of x yeah. is less than or equal to x sine one over x is less than or equal to the absolute value of x. Okay. Right. You've got the upper function. You've got the lower function, and you've got the guy in between. So you say, well, what's the limit 
as x approaches 0, um, we know the limit of the absolute value of x as x approaches 0 is just 0. The limit of negative the absolute value of x as x approaches 0 is also 0. So by the pinching theorem, Uh, the limit of the guy in the middle is also zero. Even though that, even though the function looks kind of crazy, the pinching theorem says it's not going to be that crazy. Its craziness is controlled. Why do you need the absolute value? Need the absolute. Suppose you don't have the absolute value. Um, <coughs> uh, you mean suppose I take these absolute values off? <laughs> And then, it, then it's actually false, um, because I look at the picture. This is the line y equals x, right? This is the line y equals negative x, right? And here's my function, right? x is bigger than the function, and negative x is smaller than the function. But over here, negative x is bigger than the function, okay. right? And x is, is smaller than the function. Okay. Right, so I don't want to take them off because then it becomes false okay. on the on the left hand side of the picture. Okay. Okay. Um, right. Okay. Are, are you, everyone, everyone, getting an idea of of the pinching theorem? Pinching theorem is sort of funny. You know, it's it's almost always in 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 the in the examples or, or problems in the book. It's almost always something like this, right? You have some you have some wild trigonometric function, and then you're multiplying by some polynomial, and then you have to you know find something that's bigger and find something that's smaller. Okay, but it's it it all boils down to this this game basically. Okay. So the the problems are not are not that interesting. They're all sort of this type. But we're going to use the pinching theorem to get some, some useful facts. So let me see if I can get to them. OK, so some applications of the pinching theorem. Um, the first one is that uh, the limit of sine of x as x approaches 0 is 0. <coughs> so here's the proof. Um, at least for, for x bigger than 0. So um, I, you say, well, look, um, let's, suppose that, let's suppose that x is some, some small uh, positive number some small positive angle here. Okay. And this is the this is the unit unit circle. Okay. Um, where is where is sine of x on this picture? What where is sine of x on this picture? Y. It's the y coordinate of this point, right? It's the length of this line, right? This thing here has length sine of x. So I'm going to give proof by picture. Um, and what's the length of this arc here? <coughs> what's the length of this arc? This angle is x. It's going to be x, right? right? If this is x, this is x in radians, what does that mean? That means that this length is, is x. That's exactly what it means. OK, so from the picture, from the picture, You see that um, uh, x is bigger than sine x, and sine x is bigger than zero. Then uh, take the limit, the limit of x as x approaches zero. The limit of 0 as x approaches 0 is 0. The limit of x as x approaches 0 is going to be 0 also. I'm 
taking the limit only on the positive side, just for the sake of, just because of my picture. <coughs> Okay, so then by the pinching theorem, the limit of the inside guy is going to be zero. So by squeeze theorem, the limit is going to be zero. Yeah, yeah. It's good enough to only do it from one side. No, you need to do it from both sides, but I'll let you do the other side. Yeah. If the other side works basically the same. Okay. Um, okay. One that I'm going to skip is that the limit of the cosine as x approaches zero is one. I'm going to skip it because I want to get to the last one, which is more important. Uh, okay. Um, but I'm going to. We're going to. We're going to assume that. Okay. We'll just assume that. So the last one is this one. The limit of sine x over x as x approaches 0 is, does anyone know this? Who said it? Marcella? No. Well, Maureen? 1. It's 1. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Turns out to be 1. Um, and here's, here's one way of seeing it. Again, proof by picture. So um, here we are again in the same setting. Uh, you have x, you have your angle x on the unit circle. Okay. And you know, we already saw that this thing here was sine x, right? This height was sine x, and you can't see that. Um, this, this height is, is sine x, right? Um, uh, this length is x, right? This is x, and what's this? <coughs> what's this length? Can anyone tell me what this length is? If I go from the unit circle up like this, and I make a triangle? Take a minute and see if you can figure out what the length of uh, this guy is. Right, so basically, I have something like uh, like this. Right? We know this this is sine x. What's what's this length? This is one. I guess. Um, what? Tangent of angle. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah. So it'll be. Um, so how do you? Why? Why do you say that? Because um, it's like tangent is the opposite over the adjacent, and the adjacent is just one. Oh, okay. Okay. So yeah. Uh, so tangent, right? Um, right. Because uh, another way of saying that is that this. What's this length? This length is the cosine. Right? So the ratio of sides is sine to cosine, right? Sine to cosine, and this had better be sine over cosine to 1. Right? So this, like, this thing over here is sine over cosine. Right? The tangent. Good. Okay. Okay. 
Now, um, let's look at the areas of these three things. Consider the areas. Okay. Here you have this triangle, right? The area is going to be one half base times height. Over here, you have one half base times height. And this thing in the middle, um, this circular uh, sector in the middle, does anyone know this? Um, if the angle is x, what's the area of the circular sector? It'll be, <coughs> it's okay if you don't, it'll be x over 2. Right, because you have um, x over 2 pi times pi r squared. Right, x over 2 pi is how much of the circle you're taking up. Pi r squared is the area of the circle. Right, so what portion of the circle do I have? Multiplied by the area of the circle, so I get x over 2. Okay. Okay, so then we have this thing here. I'm going to, I'm going to, um, uh, divide every, I'm going to multiply everything by 2, right? Multiply everything by 2. I'm going to get rid of these halves. And I'm going to divide everything by sine. So I get okay. Sine is positive, since x is positive. So again, we're doing x, x positive, but it'll work the other way as well. OK. And then what am I going to do? We're going to, what? I can't hear you. <laughs> I'm old. I'm getting old. What's, what are you saying? Plug what in? Into what? Plug zero in for <coughs> x. Well, let's take the take the limit, right? We'll take the limit, right? So the limit of cosine x as x approaches zero is one. The limit of one over cosine x as x approaches zero is also one, right? So by the pinching theorem, right? So by the squeeze theorem, the limit of the inside guy is also one. Right, and we can put one over that to get to get this thing. That that's that gives us this, that's basically saying the same thing as this. That the limit of of this thing is that is also one. Okay. So this is a, a result that's pretty pretty cool. Okay. Um, okay. So yeah, I think uh, there there are there are there are other a couple other facts that that. Um, you know, they, they have things like the limit of x to the n as x approaches c is c to the 1 over n to the limit of sine of x as x approaches c is actually sine of c. The limit of cosine of x as x approaches c is also cosine of c. Okay, so there are, these, there are also these facts. Let me just say, take a look at them. But the, this is the main thing. These are the most important things in the, in the chapter, in the section. Okay, that's it for today.